Um, but today what I'm sharing with you is part of a project that was born while doing the research for my current book manuscript that, as Ken said, is titled Spectral Remains, Politics of Memory in the Afterglow of Hugo Chavez's Bolivarian Revolution. And while I was working on the research for that project, I had the opportunity to attend the opening night of Venezuelan performance artist Deborah Castillo's exhibit Raw in 2015. Now, I didn't know Deborah personally back then, but I did know that she had been the subject of controversy back in Venezuela because of a video performance she had made in 2013 called The Emancipatory Kiss, which you can see a bit now, where she kisses the bust of Simón Bolívar for over three minutes. Now, however uncomfortable you think that would be to watch, and I don't have time to show you, but you can check out her performance in her video account in uh, Vimeo, it probably doesn't match the discomfort and the outrage that this piece created back in Venezuela, which made Castillo receive death threats and be accused in the state-sponsored television show Cayendo y Corriendo of disrespecting the memory of Simón Bolívar, the Padre de la Patria, and the memory of Hugo Chávez, who throughout his time in power repeatedly underscored the intimate connection he and his political project had with Bolívar. Bolívar, for those of you who don't know him, was the country's liberator and remains the object of a widely studied cult that has made him, as Rafael Sanchez points out, the supreme embodiment and manifestation of the Venezuelan people and the symbolic force that grounds the authority of the state, ultimately legitimizing its actions and its violence. Now, the reception of this piece was a big part of the reason Castillo was forced to leave Venezuela and she moved to New York City, where she worked on the video and live performances that make up Raw. In the opening night, as you walked inside the gallery, the first thing that you saw was a bust of what, of what seemed to be a nameless military man or caudillo. The caudillo, however, was not made with bronze or marble, but, but with unprocessed clay, which made him appear incomplete, vulnerable, malleable, or as the title of the exhibit promise, raw. This state of rawness was not unique to the bust. In fact, it permeated the entire gallery space. 600 pounds of wet clay had been hand pressed into the windows. And as the clay started to dry, pieces of it would fall to the ground, covering it with gray dust that stuck to shoes, clothes, and faces. The space didn't feel like an art gallery with its polished surfaces, clean floors, and bright lights, but rather like an artist's workshop, a space that underscored not the finalized product, but the rawness of the labor behind it. It was this labor, more than the sculptures it created, that grabs the public's attention. It was embedded in the clay covering the windows, which recalled the physical effort that went into grabbing each pound of clay and pressing it by hand into each window. It made its presence felt in the movement of Castillo's hand as it slowly masturbated the phallus-shaped nose of another military man made of clay in the video performance demagogue. It appeared also in the sensual journey that a pair of clay hands and forearms traced along Castillo's body, while in the video performance, the unnameable, she slowly moved them over her face and down her chest. Lastly, it fueled the moment of climax that ended the night when Castillo, standing in front of the boss of the caudillo, started slapping it, each slap disfiguring the head and separating it little by little from the neck until it finally gave way and fell onto the ground. Now, we can say many things about these performances, but what stayed with me was the way in which they use materiality and the way it drew you in. It made you feel like you were feeling her actions in the palm of your hands like a sort of phantom tingling. This idea of being involved in the materiality of the pieces and what that meant came back to me when three years later, in March 2018, I was in, the, I was in a crowd of people gathering in New York City's Washington Square Park around a big black structure made of pieces of wood forming a seemingly abstract shape and covering the small white squares. Closer inspection revealed that the wooden pieces formed the map of Venezuela. Furthermore, the white squares turned out to be QR codes that once scanned with a phone revealed the identities of the more than 200 people who lost their lives in Venezuela between February 2014 and February 2018 during protests against Nicolás Maduro's regime. The installation, Requiem 200 by Venezuelan artist Violet Bule, asked us to ask something of those of us who approach it with our phones and our cameras ready to take a picture. It asked us to come closer, to download the app that Bulle had created for the installation, to pick a QR code, to scan it, and to witness as our phone screens were transformed into pocket-sized tombstones for the faraway dead. In other words, it asked us to slow down and let our chatter dissolve into an uncomfortable silence that brought us together in a wordless requiem. When considered separately, Castillo's exhibition and Bullen's installation each tell their own story. 
But when put side by side, a compelling similarity emerges between the two works. Both artists rely on raw matter, wood, water, clay, nails, and QR codes to represent Venezuela for an international audience that might or might not be familiar with the country's history and current reality. Members of this audience are nevertheless encouraged to renounce their roles as passive spectators and participate in an act that brings together processes of remembrance, imagination, subversion, and translation, and that links the local and the global, the intimate and the public, the individual and the collective, virtuality and materiality, an act that I call crafting nationness. The term nationness was coined by Benedict Anderson to encompass concepts as difficult to define as nation, nationality, and nationalism. He defines it as the most universally legitimate value in the political life of our time, and along with nationalism, as cultural artifacts of a particular kind. Diana Taylor takes Anderson's vague definition to mean, and I quote, the idea of nation, which includes everything from the bureaucratic fad of citizenship to the nationalist mythical construct of a nation as an eternal entity. And she focuses on the performativity of nationness, which involves, she argues, the double mechanism of imagining and imposing national and gender identity. In the context of Castillo Sambulo's work, I propose a different conceptualization of nationness that centers on the ness, a suffix that evokes both proximity to and distance from the nation, a quality or state that refers back to the nation, but that also appears freed from the boundaries that limit it to a specific time and place. Thus, I understand nationness as the nation outside the nation, a resonance, a feeling or a residue that it speaks to and of the nation without having to speak from it, the challenges assumptions regarding the what, the where, and the how of the nation, and that as such underscores movement, malleability, and indetermination. Like Anderson, I take nationness to be a cultural artifact of a particular kind, yet unlike him, I don't focus on the ways in which language and literature are mobilized to imagine the nation, but on the materials that are used to represent it. My conceptualization echoes Taylor's emphasis on performativity. However, I propose that the performative aspect of nationness encompasses not only the ways in which bodies act and engage with each other, but also the ways in which they engage with materiality, with the nation as raw matter, with imagination as craft. This understanding of nationness invites an approach to the nation that deviates from the strict ideological stances that frame the concept in Venezuela along the extremely polarized political divide between those who support the government and those in the opposition. While not entirely separate from the issues at the center of this polarization, nationness illuminates the nuances and complexities that permeate the symbolic and material efforts to remember, imagine, and represent the nation among the diaspora community of Venezuelan artists like Castillo and Mule. Forced to leave Venezuela because of political repression, fear of violence, economic hardship, and lack of institutional support, the two artists moved to New York for what they felt would be a brief period. This move never translated into renouncing their country or into a clean, painless, and absolute separation. Nor did it translate into a paralyzing feeling of nostalgia that demanded the work remain unchanged and unaffected by their new environment and circumstances. In fact, Castillo notes, and I quote, my artistic production has obviously become richer, but it has also undergone important conceptual and technical changes. I had to adapt my system of production to the mobility of the diaspora. These changes included for her rethinking power, not only in terms of its local configuration in the Venezuelan reality, but also from a more global perspective that it speaks to her multinational audience. Bule, in turn, notes that once her pieces reach an audience of both Venezuelans and non-Venezuelans, they, she says, become strong and autonomous, reaching audiences both inside and outside the country, regardless of their ideological position. The artists and their work thus occupy a space of in-betweenness. They oscillate between local concerns and global demands, the virtual and the material, English and Spanish, the catharsis of the saogo and the crafting of memoria. Through this oscillation, Castillo and Bull engage their audience in a back and forth between what is happening over there and what is happening over here that ultimately represents Venezuela as Venezuelanness, that is, as nationness, as a body as malleable as Castillo's clay and as indeterminate as Bull's misshapen map. In this project, I examine the production of nationness in Castillo's exhibition Raw and Bull's installation Requiem through the lens of craft crafting. Crafting, I propose, underscores not the finished product, but the very process of making, the ongoingness of the relationship between the maker and the thing being made, the coming together and coming apart of flesh and clay and breath and wood, the open-endedness of a sculpture that is not yet. It takes us into the space of the workshop where the floor is dirty, 
where the nails are exposed, and where our hands are awakened by the tingling sensation that pushes us to touch and shape the stuff a nation is made of. I argue that this act of crafting is interactive and critical. It doesn't simply remember Venezuela and reproduce it as a spectacle to be passively consumed, but provides the possibility of intervening in systems of power and representation that determine which bodies are visible and which are not, which bodies have power and which do not, which bodies are mourned and who should mourn them. It offers the space and the means to question national identity, opening up the possibility of thinking about Venezuela differently, beyond the spatial boundaries of its territory, beyond the icons that monopolize the collective imaginary, and beyond the extreme polarization of its politics. Before we look more closely at the works themselves, I would like to spend a bit of time reflecting on the concept of crafting. Though we might think of it in terms of making something by hand, crafting is never just about hands making things. It is a way of being and becoming in the world. Claire Burke and Susanna Spencer Wood present crafting as inherently informed by socially and culturally constituted knowledge, beliefs, and expectations. A practice that produces, reproduces, and changes the crafter, the object made, and the world. As an embodied experience, crafting involves a reciprocal relationship in co-creating a meaningful material social world. This emphasis on reciprocity is key. Crafting not only brings into being a material object, but also a subject whose body and whose worldview is shaped through the central experiences of handcrafting. There is thus in crafting the potential to change the material world and the relations between people and things. This conceptualization of crafting renders it a form of critical making, an activity that provides both the possibility to intervene substantively in systems of authority and power, and that offers an important site for reflecting on how such power is constituted. And where the emphasis is not on the material object to be displayed as a final product, but on the act of shared construction, joint conversation, and reflection. This understanding of critical making, I propose, informs both Castillo's and Bulla's approaches to the making of their work and to the role the audience plays in it. In the case of Castillo, her performances and installations never produce an object for the audience to passively view. What the audience is exposed to is the act of making and unmaking that shapes and unshapes the body of power. And it is worth pointing out that Castillo's actions don't have a clear ending. There is no way to tell when Castillo is done because the image on the screen fades, denying us any sort of closure and forcing us to wonder about and imagine the after ourselves. Bulle also denies us an ending. Requiem doesn't end when the wooden structure is physically removed from the space where it was exhibited, but continues online. Under the tab Requiem 200 support, the archive containing the information of those who were killed during protests against Maduro, regardless of their political affiliation, grows as users provide new data. The collaboration that started during the installation as the participants use their phones to give visibility to the dead thus carries on, a seemingly fleeting performance turned into ongoing social practice. As we consider this understanding of crafting, we must take into account the role gender has played in the way this activity has been conceived historically. More specifically, the way crafting in various contexts became a mechanism to discipline and shape female bodies. There were, of course, many occasions on which women resisted the idleness of crafting and turned the activity into an opportunity to challenge their exclusion from the workforce and from the male-dominated art world. In the context of Venezuela, one such example is discussed at length in Beatriz Gonzalez Estefan's work titled Subversive Needlework, Gender, Class, and History at Venezuela's National Exhibition, 1883. In 1883, under the presidency of Antonio Guzman Blanco, Venezuela organized its first national exhibition to commemorate the birth of Simón Bolívar. The year before, an official announcement had been made stating that no group was to be excluded from this act of commemoration, and a special care was put into inviting Venezuelan women to present their handicrafts and demonstrate their skill and diligence. Women's participation was overwhelming, with hundreds of pieces that included carpet and mat making, textiles, weaving, and hair art. In this last category, there was a picture of the heroine of Colombian independence, Policarpa Salabarrieta, embroidered with human hair, which was submitted by an unknown Miss J. Paz Guevara. In Gonzalez Estefan's analysis, this portrait and the other works that were made by women and in which she notes Bolivar's face was significantly absent, challenged the monopoly of other figures and notable men populating the collective imagination and turned the exhibition into a starting point to rethink the issue of gender and gendering in the country. For women, she notes, the exhibition was a political act that allowed them to rethink the nation, as well as to think themselves part of it. 
in a certain way, it gave them a voice, if only a voice expressed through the chisel or through needle and thread. So over 100 years separated Venezuela's 1883 national exhibition from these pieces that I'm presenting to you today, the determination to rethink the nation, to reflect on women's access to and participation in it, and to challenge its male-dominated foundational imaginary remains urgent and relevant. And once again, this critical exercise is carried out through crafting, though no longer because that is the only means of artistic production at a women's disposal, but because crafting takes the battle for inclusion and representation away from the result, the thing already made, the image already thought of, and into the space of production, the workshop filled with materials waiting to be shaped, the nation suspended in an indefinite not yet. There is thus in Castillo's shaping and reshaping of her clay and in Bulle's sawing and hammering of wood, a will to intervene in the crafting of the nation that challenges the monopoly of the liberator's figure in the creation of it. It is their hands and not Bolivar's that give shape to Venezuela and to the figures that constitute it. And that ultimately create a body of the nation that doesn't look like the, like the liberator and that doesn't constitute a synchronic totality, a body that is yet unimagined, malleable, and thus open to change and interpretations a DIY or do-it-yourself body. The DIY body comes together and apart outside the territory of the nation. Thus, I have proposed to talk about it in terms of nationness, the nation outside the nation, the stuff that makes up the nation as it is remembered, imagined, and redefined in transit through the mobility and instability that characterize diasporic communities. In the case of Bulle and Castillo, their experience as immigrants and the opportunities they have had to come into contact with other communities, cultures, and languages broaden the scope of their artistic production in a way that ultimately shapes how Venezuela appears in their work. As Rekim shows, Venezuela and its dead are not presented as a foreign and hermetic spectacle to be observed, but become an experience to be shared, a reality that interpolates Venezuelans and non-Venezuelans alike, and that invites us to consider the role Venezuela plays on the global stage. Similarly, the imperative to make her work relevant to non-Venezuelan audiences has made Castillo open up her critical performance on power to include not only the Venezuelan caudillo, but also other figures that allow her to explore the marriage of masculinity and authority. And what you see on the screen right now is two pieces, one by Violet Bullet titled Dream America, where she discusses um, the life of Latin American immigrants in the United States, not just Venezuelans. And the other is a piece by Deborah Castillo called Gestos de Poder, where she discusses this marriage between masculinity um, and authority in other figures, um, not just in Venezuela, and that you can see a little bit on the screen. I would argue that this need to translate their work, a translation that is not only linguistic, but also cultural, leads to a freedom of artistic expression that when directed at the Venezuelan reality they engage with, becomes productively subversive. As both artists explore new identities, experiment with new materials, and respond to the demands of the new environments, they allow themselves to think the nation differently, free from the constraints imposed by not only the Venezuelan government and its censorship policies, but also by the familiar patterns that in the national imaginary define Venezuela within Venezuela. In what follows, I explore this version through an analysis of raw and requiem that pays close attention to the agencies the works activate, the narratives they call into question, and the figures they reshape, all of which, taken together, rethink Venezuela by crafting Venezuelanness. Raw. In Castillo's exhibition, raw appears to have two meanings. The first defines raw as an adjective that describes something uncooked, unprocessed, and that draws your attention to the malleability, softness, wetness, and overall instability of the material Castillo uses to build her sculptures, clay. Unlike bronze, marble, or stone, raw clay transforms Castillo's sculptures from what George Didi Uberman calls objects of space into subtle actions of a site, into taking or having place. In their ongoingness, Castillo's sculptures refuse to forget their own birth as they emphasize the entanglement of agent, action, and result, ultimately sacrificing the stability and finality of a finished piece to the possibilities opened by the movement of Castillo's hands over the nose of demagogue, which you see right in the middle, and over the bust of the still wet caudillo standing at the center of the gallery space over here. The eye-catching red of Castillo's nail polish intensifies the protagonism of her hands. As the audience's eyes focus on the red of the nails, we're reminded that the figures we see, nameless bodies that evoke at once Bolivar and the military heads of the state who govern Venezuela after him, as well as military and authoritarian men from other places and other times, are all handmade. 
In the world of icons, this realization is far from being consequential. As Bruno Latour argues, to show the hands that make the icon is tantamount to desecrating it, sullying its origin and weakening its force. If you say that an icon is man-made, or in this case, woman-made, you nullify the transcendence of the divinities. A critical mind, he argues, is one that shows the hands of humans at work everywhere, so as to slaughter the sanctity of religion, the belief in fetishes, the worship of the transcendental, heaven-sent icons, the strength of ideologies. This unsettling force that derives from seeing the hand that shapes the figure before it rises into an icon is at the center of Castillo's performances. In both Demagogue and The Unnameable, the hands occupy the center of the shot. Their slow movement lacking the determination to create once and for all the figure that is hinted at but never completed in the shaping and unshaping of the role play. Instead, the movement of the hands is suspended in a state of indetermination that is marked by pleasure, playfulness, and in the case of a slapping power, anger and frustration. All emotions that deviate from the state of respectful contemplation demanded by the sublime and the transcendental. It is thus not the icon, but the making of the icon that the audience watches and is invited to participate in. In fact, as they navigate a space that is not a gallery, but a workshop, those in the audience find themselves surrounded by surfaces that beg to be touched, that appear to vibrate with anticipation as they wait for the unexpected yet desired encounter with someone's, anybody's wandering hands. Hence the pounds of clay on the windows and the bus occupying the center of the space. In their raw, unprotected and incomplete state, they articulate a silent but powerful invitation to the audience to craft them too, a figure that is through the endless possibilities opened up by the potentiality of a new touch when they're powerless because it isn't done yet. The audience's involvement in Castillo's performances bring us to the second meaning of raw, naked, irritated, and sore skin. At first glance, this understanding of raw materializes in Castillo's naked body and in the sculptures themselves, in the handcrafting that both shapes and unshapes them, and that overlaps the birth of each of the figure's features with cuts and abrasions that threaten to destroy or at the very least deform them. There is, however, another kind of irritation, one that is tied to the sensuality of crafting and that recast it as a practice that sensitizes the very surface of the skin, Castillo's as well as the audience's. And I'm gonna show you right now um, her performance. Watching Castillo make her clay figures means watching her caress them, masturbate them, and use their stiff limbs to touch her own naked body. It means watching and participating in a form of handcrafting that is erotic. Both porn studies and media studies offer us productive ways of understanding the effect that this erotic handcrafting has on the audience that encounters it in Castillo's exhibition. Vivian Sobchak's Carnal Thoughts, for instance, underscores the moment body and image cease to be two separate and discrete units and become engaged in a constant activity of reciprocal realignment and inflection. Elizabeth Gross conceptualizes perception as the flesh's reversibility, the flesh touching, seeing, perceiving itself. Susanna Passonen uses the term carnal resonance to unravel the material and visceral sensations and vibrations that are caused by encounters with pornography. Lastly, Linda Williams proposes innervation to underscore the experience of not only taking in and being moved by the images that surround us, but also transmitting energy from the inside of our bodies back to the outside world. Tying all these concepts together is the understanding that the exposure to images like the ones in raw, essential crafting where surfaces rub against each other, where flesh shapes and unshapes flesh like clay, charges us with vitality. As the bodies on screen move, we too are moved. We feel our skin vibrate with self-awareness, with self-mastery, and with an energy that cannot be contained by the malleable body that vulnerable to the touch has lost its hold on power, ideology, authority, and signification. The nature of this intimacy is of course undetermined. It might be desirable, surprising, unwanted, disturbing, even repulsive. Yet what is undeniable is its existence, the power it gives us, whether we want it or not, whether we need it or not. Within the context of Raw, that power finds an actual outlet in the performance Slapping Power, where Castillo slaps the bust that throughout the night she had been reshaping and perfecting. The slapping, however, is not just hers, it is the audience's too. Stimulated, energetic, and determined, the bodies in the audience cheer, scream, clap, and encourage Castillo to hit the head harder and faster. And I'm gonna show you part of that video now.
Here she actually slapping. As each slap disfigures the face little by little, it is the audience that must provide the answer. The name doesn't matter. What matters is the power of changing the face of power, of being disloyal to tradition, of being careless with masculinity, and of knowing that the power stays with us in the tingling of our hands, even after the head has finally fallen to the ground. Requiem. Willis' installation stages the loss of over 200 lives during the protests that took place in Venezuela between 2014 and 2018. Translated into QR codes print, printed on a small white squares, these lives pierce the surface of a structure made of pieces of wood covering black paint with the nails holding it together dangerously exposed, and that doesn't hide the random holes that make each piece resemble a wooden limb. Passersby react to this installation with a combination of rejection and attraction. Without any information that explains quickly and clearly what the wood means or what the codes are, we're tempted to walk past what looks like something raw and incomplete, a sort of work in progress in the middle of an improvised outdoor workshop. Yet the legibility of the installation also pulls us in. The familiarity of the codes triggers our technological curiosity, while the wooden coffin-like structure and the requiem in the title alert us to the fact that someone died and moves us to find out who. Willis' decision to render loss illegible in this way not only acts as a form of resistance against the hypervisibility and thus invisibility of monuments and the media produces spectacularity of death, but it also creates an unsettling vulnerability in the audience, which recalls Judith Walter's understanding of the disorientation of grief as a form of productive unknowingness of the self. In Precarious Life, Butler asks, if we stay with a sense of loss, are we left feeling only passive and powerless, as some might fear? Or are we rather returned to a sense of human vulnerability, to our collective responsibility for the physical lives of one another? As she then states, the disorientation of grief, who have I become, or indeed, what is left of me, what is said in the other that I have lost, posits the eye in the mode of unknowingness. Standing in front of the map of a country that is presumably, but not explicitly, Venezuela, and scanning QR codes of 200 dead who stick to our screens and linger in our phones, we find ourselves wondering, like Butler, who we are and what we have lost. That we're forced to ask ourselves that question is the result of Willick's success in first using raw matter to create a collectively shared feeling of grief. The raw matter that she uses is wood, an organic material that came from a recently living organism and the like a corpse is capable of decay. This connection between the wooden map and the corpse is further implied by what Renu Boda would call the texture with two X's of the wooden piece. Texture, Boda argues, is dense with information about how an object substantively, historically, and materially came into being, thus differing from texture with one X, which defiantly or even invisibly blocks or refuses such information. Texture is loud. It draws her attention to the bumps, blemishes, holes, and rough edges, and to the stories that they tell, the stories that in the case of Bullet's installation speak of the violence of Bullet's wounded bodies. In fact, each of the pieces that make up the map appears wounded. Furthermore, the black coloring of the wood along with the name of the installation evoke an atmosphere of funerary rites and mourning. We're invited to participate in a requiem for a, for a body that we don't know, that we can't recognize, and that yet, because it materializes right there in front of us, undeniably present and fatally wounded, we mourn. There is thus in Bullet's installation an attempt to turn the audience's first encounter with the wooden structure into an act of grief that precedes familiarity and recognition. Rather than knowing the life that has been lost and then mourning its absence, we mourn it before we know it. The presence of the wounded and decomposing body, the materialization of vulnerability, wraps us into the sort of interpolation Butler talks about, where we understand that the life lost is somehow connected to us and that we're responsible for it somehow. This grief that is born out of a state of pre-recognition is not meant to be paralyzing, but becomes an invitation to engage in a form of memory crafting that leads to collective remembering. And that begins with us taking our phones out, downloading the free app, and scanning one of the 200 QR codes. In my conversations with Bule, she underscored the immense effort it took for her to collect the information for the QR codes. She said, it took us a year to obtain and compare information that we acquired through various virtual platforms, newspapers, Twitter, Facebook, blogs, etc. We prepared a list that we kept rechecking, since in many cases, the same pictures appeared with different names or there was information we couldn't access until we finally put together a solid and coherent set of data. 
I have an open portal in my website where people can write me and corroborate, correct, or add information. Searching, collecting, and recording the details of the deaths that occurred during the protest, a responsibility that typically lies with the state and its organisms or with the NGOs or with the press, becomes a task that Bule must take on herself and that leads to the creation of a DIY or do-it-yourself archive for the dead. The why in this DIY archive is plural. As Bule explains, the digital archive is ongoing and open to fact-checking, new editions, changes in format, etc. This restless archive that she creates and in which we can participate allows us to contribute to the creation of an afterlife that escapes the reach of the state and the boundaries of the nation state and that produces a memory that doesn't stay or circulates, migrates, travels, a work that is continually in progress rather than a reified object. The participatory nature of this restless archive and of Bullis installation in general leads to a form of collective remembrance. Remembrance in this context is a deliberate process of memory construction rather than a matter of simple ritual. Lorraine Hetke and John Winslade coined the term in the crafting of grief to refer to a process of becoming that does not dispatch, and I quote, the memory, legacy, and stories of the dead to the grave, but seeks to maximize the possibility of the deceased person being woven into the lives of the living. Hetke and Winslade provide a productive framework for the study of grief that underscores the membership alluded to in remembrance. In membership, they argue, there is a sense of belonging and the potential of creating a community where relational exchanges occur not only among the living, but also among the living and the dead who come back through storytelling, tangible objects and ceremonial occasions. This community serves not only to make the deceased visible, but also to enable people to stand against the dominant discourses that dismiss them. In the case of Bulle's installation, this process of remembrance occurs through the creation of a space of networks and interfaces, a point of contact, a shared surface, where bodies and histories stick to each other, reflecting Sarah Ahmed's conception of a stickiness, which I quote, is an effect of the histories of contact between bodies, objects, and signs that involve a form of relationality or a withness in which the elements that are with get bound together. As a virtual dead leave an impression on our phones and thus stick to us, a form of memory emerges where remembering requires being with the other in a space that is neither here nor there, neither theirs nor ours, but that binds us all together in a group where there are no prerequisite ideology, political allegiance, nationality, or belonging. Willis Reckham therefore creates a community of mourners where the sense of belonging exists outside of and separated from the territory and the political polarization of Venezuela. Grief, grief is not a response automatically following the loss of a familiar life, but is instead crafted, a deliberate action that Bulle constructs through the crafting of a wounded wooden body that is grievable despite being unfamiliar. Grieving thus becomes a way of knowing. Already grieving, we learn the faces and the stories of the dead who are already ours, regardless of their national or political identity. In Bulle's installation, then, we find an echo of Andrew Hoskins' claim that we are the most accountable generation in history. Bulle makes us accountable not only by making us grievers, but also by creating a digital archive where the dead count and are accounted for and putting it in our hands, literally and figuratively. Through their artistic practices, Castillo and Bulle invite us to reflect on what a nation looks like outside its geographical borders in an elsewhere where nationhood gives way to nationness. This question is not unique to the Venezuelan diaspora or to diasporic communities in general. In an ever-changing world of globalization and new technologies, this question also resonates with the national territories where inhabitants must grapple with, if not the reality, then at least the possibility of existing in a borderless horizontal place where selves and identities are constantly being reimagined and remade. Neither Castillo nor Bulle provide an answer to that question. Rather, they both underscore the potential that lies in the question itself and the possibility it opens up of engaging in an act of crafting where the nation appears as a work in progress. Their exhibitions and installations don't produce a stable and easily consumable image of Venezuela for the audience to take with them, but instead propose a Venezuela in the making, a shapeless lump of clay, a disorienting overlap of wooden pieces and QR codes that don't show us anything, but that drag us into them, turning us into crafters who participate in an act of critical making where the end result doesn't matter as much as the narratives that are exchanged, the agencies that are activated, and the mourning that is shared as Venezuela is reconceptualized as Venezuelanness. While this form of critical making can and does take place inside the nation, 
outside the nation, it becomes subversive in a way that is tied to the particular conditions that characterize the reality of diasporic communities. Always in between here and there, the past and the future, the need to remember and the demand to adapt, artists like Castillo and Boulet engage in a daily renegotiation of what Venezuela is that while challenging and at times painful, also results in the freedom to fearlessly and irreverently contest what is deemed sacred or unchangeable within the nation. Castillo's erotic crafting challenges the power of the male figures that monopolize political power in Venezuela and also elsewhere. Bula creates a community through an act of mourning and collective remembrance that make the Venezuelan dead everyone's dead, regardless of national or political identities. It would be tempting to argue that this subversion, like the two artists, remains abroad. However, the fact that the artist's work exists in the web, circulating, migrating, and traveling across time and space, shared on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and events like this, suggests that in between here and there, Venezuelanness and Venezuela might find themselves in a productive dialogue that leads to the crafting of new and much needed political futures. Thank you.